All right, so let's get started. Last session of the day. Uh, this session is, uh, we're gonna have a treat. This session is on zero knowledge proofs. Uh, we're gonna start with two talks on folding and we're gonna end with an invited talk by um, uh, Eli Ben Sasson on uh, Starks and Starknets and th where that's going. Okay, so the first, the first lecture in the session is on Hypernova, uh, recursive arguments for customizable constraint systems by uh, Abraham and Srinath, and Srinath is gonna give the talk. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So this talk is about Hypernova, which is a new recursive argument for customizable constraint systems. Given that this session is titled Snarks from Folding Schemes, I thought I'll start by recalling what a snark is. A snark is a non-interactive protocol where the prover proves that it knows some witness to some statement. For example, it could prove that it knows a value x such that short of six applied to x uh, results in a public value y. In general, the snark prover proves that it knows a value w such that the circuit applied to w along with some public input x makes the circuit output one. A trivial proof system is one in which the prover just sends its witness and the verifier checks if the circuit is satisfying under that witness. A snark achieves better properties. First, the size of a proof is smaller, for example, sublinear or polylogarithmic in the size of the statement proven. The cost to verify a proof is also uh, smaller than the cost to check the witness. Given that snarks have many applications, there has been tons of work over the past decade or so. Unfortunately, the prover time remains a key bottleneck in snarks because they require many MSMs, or FFTs, or both. In general, the proving algorithm is also harder to parallelize or distribute. These are exactly the problems addressed by folding scheme-based snarks. In particular, they provide the fastest prover when proving semi-structured circuits. These new snarks also have a prover that's far easier to parallelize and distribute. More recently, there has been this notion of lookup singularity. One way to think about this work is that they are, they are a more efficient way to represent computation. In particular, they actually need folding scheme-based snarks to be able to scale to large computations. So now let me introduce what a folding scheme is. At a high level, it takes as input uh, some statements that we want to prove. For example, two circuit satisfiability instances defined with respect to the same circuit. Then it just outputs a folded statement. There are some key properties here. First, the size of the output statement is uh, the same as the size of one of the input statements. So it provides some sort of compression. Second, if the input statements are true, then the output statement is also true, so it can be proven. If any in input statement is false, then the folded statement is guaranteed to be false. So if the prover knows a satisfying witness for the folded statement, then it also must know satisfying witnesses for the input statements. So proving the folded statement is equivalent to proving the original uh, input statements. So here is a sketch of how we would build a snark from a folding scheme. Suppose we have n statements. These n statements could be uh, all independent. For example, uh, a batch of signature verifications, or they could all be uh, steps of a single computation. For example, verifying some roll-up transactions that all share some global state. We can apply the folding scheme on a pair of input statements to get a folded statement. We can keep doing this recursively until we just have one folded statement. By the properties of the folding scheme, uh, proving this one folded statement is equivalent to proving all the original n statements. So this folded statement can be proven just by providing the witness. The size of this uh, proof is linear in the size of one step. In particular, it's independent of the number of statements that were folded. So with a folding scheme, a proof is roughly the witness of one step, so which can be uh, megabytes in size, depending on the number of gates in the step. In contrast, snarks provide tiny proofs, for example, kilobytes. They're also very efficient for the verifier. They can also prove unstructured computations. But as folding schemes are prover efficient, they get this efficiency because they focus on the semi-structured computations. So the best approach is to actually combine both. Uh, in particular, we use the folding scheme as a prover efficient pre-processing to fold n steps of a computation into one 
and then use SNARKs as the very far efficient post-processing to prove that one folded step. The result of this combination is a prover efficient SNARK. Given this promise, there has been an explosion of works uh, on folding schemes over the last uh, few years. No one BCL BCLMS papers were released uh, at the, around the beginning of 2021. No was actually inspired by a, a large line of work, most notably the inner product arguments or bulletproofs. So these protocols fold two inner product instances into one. Uh, NOVA can then be seen as a generalization of this pattern to arbitrary circuits. Last summer, we finished a full implementation of NOVA. This was developed as an open source project. It was actually shaped by requirements for a NOVA-based verifiable delay function, which is a collaborative effort among EF, Filecoin, Supranational, and Microsoft Research. The NOVA code depends crucially on libraries built by many of these partners. In 2023, there was a lot of proposals to improve folding schemes. I think these were uh, catalyzed by several things. First, there was a ZK whiteboard session by Justin Drake. Then Nico from Geometry released a white paper that extends NOVA to Planckish arithmetization. Finally, there was an excellent uh, lecture on folding schemes by Dan. Finally, this summer, we there were a bunch of works, uh, and I'm going to talk about one of these works in this talk. Uh, later in the summer, there was also a bug in the original implementation of NOVA on a two-cycle of curves. We later released an approach that sort of overcomes some of these difficulties with instantiating uh, folding scheme-based SNARKs on a cycle of curves. Just this morning, there was a paper that sort of shows how to extend HyperNOVA to dis proving distributed computations. It might be difficult to keep track of all of these works, so there is an awesome pa folding page that has a, a list of all the resources related to folding. So now, now that I've given an overview, let me start with uh, HyperNova in a nutshell. So it's a snark for semi-structured computation and it's based on folding schemes. So it can prove sequential computations. It can also prove distributed and concurrent computations, for example, MapReduce. One of the key improvements over general snarks like Planck or Marlin is that the proving speed is approximately the speed to commit to the witness with an MSM. This can be significant. For example, it could be orders of magnitude lower than uh, those general purpose snarks, depending on the circuit. There are some exciting subsequent works like Protostar. As I'll show you later, there are some uh, advantages to Hypernova. So in the rest of this talk, I'll, focus, I'll first provide a simplified problem statement. Then I'll describe prior approaches to recursion. Then I'll provide some information about NOVA, and then I'll switch to HyperNOVA. Finally, I'll provide a high-level comparison with Protostar. So at a high level, our goal is to prove some structured computation was executed correctly. As an example, we want to prove that some non-deterministic computation C applied to some initial input Z0 results in an output of Zn. By non-deterministic, uh, we mean that the circuit at each step can take some, no some witness from the prover. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to ignore several things. For example, we might want this each step to apply one of the circuits rather than just a single circuit. Uh, we might also want parallel proof generation, uh, meaning the steps of a computation are executed at once and then folded in a binary tree fashion. Or we might also want proofs of distributed or concurrent computations. But the good news is this machinery can support all of these. But for this talk, I'm going to ignore that. So this sequential model of computation is already very powerful. For example, uh, we can already build a VDF where C could be one or more invocations of some delay function like min root that takes non-trivial sequential time to compute. In a ZKVM, the C is a step of a VM, for example, EVM or LLVM, or a CPU like RISC-V. In case of ZKBridge, the C validates state rules according to the consensus rules of a blockchain. In case of ZKML, C applies one or more layers of the model. In case of photo proof, C could apply a particular transformation to a photo or a video or an audio file. In case of public key transparency, the C checks if the public key directory is append only in each epoch. So how do we prove such incremental computation? The high level idea is to uh, not prove that a step was executed correctly. Instead, we would prove an augmented circuit. 
In particular, the prover proves that it has executed not only C, but it also ex uh, uh, proves that it has executed a, a verifier expressed as a circuit. And this verifier uh, as a circuit verifies the correct execution of the prior step. So the invariant here is that uh, a proof at any step proves the correct execution of all prior steps in the sequential computation. So there are broadly three approaches to achieve this. The first one is full recursion. Uh, uh, the second one is accumulation, and the third one is folding. So in the first one, the pi i is a snark. And this verifier circuit fully verifies that snark. And it's implemented in many schemes, like fractal, Planky 2. In the second approach, pi i is a snark, but the verifier circuit partially verifies that snark. This was implemented in the Halo paper. A major downside of this is that uh, a verifier circuit is actually pretty large, so it has very large recursion overheads. They also do not provide a faster prover than the base snark that was used. So in contrast, in the case of folding, this pi i is a commitment to some witness plus some auxiliary information. V simply computes a random linear combination of these commitments. So this can be quite small. For example, the verifier circuit in case of NOVA is just 10,000 R1 CS gates. This, was, uh, uh, um, this approach was implemented in NOVA. Turns out folding provides a much faster prover than general snarks. For example, compared to ECC-based proof systems like Plonk or Marlin, just uh, does far fewer MSMs. For example, just two MSMs compared to Plonk's 11 or Marlin's 22. NOVA also has free addition gates. Uh, for, for example, for circuits that have a lot of additions, uh, think of circuits that have Poseidon, speed-ups speed are even more significant. So NOVA is also faster than Fry-based proof systems like Plonky 2 and Starkey. The, for the SHA-256 benchmark uh, from Seller, NOVA is 50 times faster than Plonky 2 and more than two times faster than Starkey. This might actually be quite surprising because uh, Starkey and Plonky 2 use 64-bit fields, and NOVA uses a 256-bit field. So for SHA-256, it turns out all the witness elements are quite small. So NOVA's MSMs are fast. This is also one of the things that was leveraged by Lasso. So one of the key takeaways here is that when comparing MSM to Fry performance, it's crucial to consider the bit width of all the scalars in the MSM. They're not always going to be 256 bits. So uh, given that we already get very good performance from NOVA, are we done? Why do we actually need hypernova? So the short answer is NOVA uses R1CS, but Plonkish, is, uh, which is another arithmetization, is preferred in practice. Fortunately, Sangria shows that NOVA extends easily to degree D Plonkish constraints. But a major downside of this work is that the prover must perform D MSMs of size proportional to the circuit size. So one of those MSMs is to commit to the witness, and D minus one MSMs is for committing to the cross terms. To see why this is a downside, let's consider an iteration of min root. Uh, so in case of R1CS, it takes three constraints to represent an iteration of min root. Uh, so NOVA would do six exponentiations per iteration, plus some cost to compute one cross term, which are all field operations. There is a degree phi constraint for expressing an iteration of min root, and uh, we just need one constraint. Sangria's cost would be five exponentiations per iteration plus the cost to compute four cross terms. So hypernova, in contrast, can do one exponentiation per iteration plus the, approximately the cost to compute four cross terms. So what, what this means is that uh, hypernova can be five times faster than NOVA or Sangria for this particular application. So to design hypernova, we could have built a folding scheme for Plonkish. Instead, we provide one for CCS, which stands for Customizable Constraint Systems. CCS, uh, the motivation to introduce CCS is the, that Plonkish and AIR are overly tailored to the particular characteristics of the proof systems they are uh, built for. In contrast, CCS is separated from the proving system used to prove CCS. So to give a quick example, uh, Plonk internally uses a permutation argument. 
So Plonkish only supports a, a restricted form of linear constraints, which are called copy constraints. In particular, the uh, Plonkish constraints can only enforce equality between two different variables in the constraint system. Whereas with R1CS and CCS, constraints are inlined, or these linear constraints are inlined, which means they are free when, uh, when used with multiplication gates. So in more detail, a CCS circuit is specified with multiple sparse matrices and multi-sets. There's also a public input X. A witness W is satisfying uh, for some Z, which is a concatenation of W, X, and one, if this equation holds. So this may look complicated, but let's consider the case of R1CS, which CCS generalizes. In case of R1CS, Q is two, and these matrices are the, the familiar ABC matrices. So M1 is A, M2 is B, and M3 is minus C. If you expand that equation, we get, oh sorry, the multi-sets are given by this uh, one and two, and the second multi-set th contains three. And if you expand this, uh, the original equation, we get this AZ times BZ minus CZ equals zero. So a key takeaway here is that these multi-sets and matrices can be programmed to represent arbitrary polynomial constraints. So now that I've introduced CCS, I'll provide an overview of uh, NOAA's folding scheme, which provides a folding scheme for folding the CCS instances. At a high level, our goal is to fold these committed CCS instances, where the verifier holds a commitment to the purported witness. A challenge, of course, is to avoid those uh, order D cross terms that I mentioned earlier. As a starting point, we break this problem into two sub-problems. First, we reduce a CCS instance into a restricted form of uh, CCS called a linearized CCS. Suppose we call that a fresh instance. Second, we fold that fresh instance with some running instance, which is also a linearized CCS instance to get an updated running instance. So what is this linearized CCS instance? It's a restricted form of committed CCS. Just like uh, CCS, it has these matrices, multi-sets, a commitment to the witness, and some public input. In addition, it also has a scalar U, some challenge R, and a set of scalars where the number of scalars is equal to the number of matrices. A witness vector is satisfying if for the concatenation of W, X, and U, uh, this linear relation holds. And we can think of this as an inner product relation because this equation uh, involving the matrix M, I, R, comma, Y can be thought of as taking a weighted combination of all the rows of the matrix and then taking an a, a inner product with the vector Z. Uh, and as before, we also want the C to be a commitment of the witness. So it turns out that uh, linearized CCS is not NP-complete because it can only encode uh, linear constraints, but this is acceptable in our setting. So now let's see how to fold these linearized CCS instances. As a starting point, I'm going to uh, focus on the simpler goal where uh, we're going to fold two linearized CCS instances with the same challenge R. The protocol is actually quite simple. The verifier just simply sends a challenge gamma and the verifier takes a weighted sum of all the elements uh, in the instance except for R. The prover similarly takes a weighted sum of the witnesses, and they both, uh, the prover outputs a witness, the verifier uh, outputs this instance, and it just copies over the value R into the output instance. We can actually see uh, completeness holds uh, by linearity. For example, if we take the output value VI, it's the weighted sum of the input values and we can expand, because the input instances are satisfying, we can expand that into a product between the matrix and some vector, and because the matrices are the same, we can collect the uh, value inside, and this is exactly the satisfiability check for the output instance. So if the input instances are satisfying, the output is also satisfying. So we solved one problem, uh, which is a folding scheme for this linearized CCS instance, turns out we actually introduced another sub-problem. In particular, the, the folding scheme that I described requires the two linearized instances to have the same random challenge R. 
So we need a new black box that can actually uh, re-randomize the running instance to have the same challenge as this fresh instance that will be output by the first box. It turns out that we can actually solve both problems in one shot with a linearizing reduction. The verifier takes as input a linearized CCS instance with some uh, 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 randomness R1 and a CCS instance. The pool takes as input witnesses to both of these instances. And then they have the same common structure, meaning they have the same matrices and multi-sets. We then run a protocol where uh, we output two linearized CCS instances that have the same randomness R, and the prover just copies the witness. And the core idea in this construction is to use the sum check protocol. It reduces CCS into linearized CCS or some challenge R, and it also re-randomizes the input linearized CCS instance to the exact same challenge R. So in summary, the folding scheme has two components. The first component invokes the sum check protocol. It only involves finite field operations. There are no cross terms that need to be committed. And the second box just takes a random linear combination of those instances. A key takeaway here is that this folding scheme is a drop-in replacement for NOVA's folding scheme. It performs two MSMs instead of one, uh, it performs one MSM instead of NOVA's two MSMs. So it's even better than NOVA's folding scheme for degree two constraints. Then uh, more crucially, the number of MSMs uh, uh, is one regardless of the degree of the constraints. Only the finite field operations grow with the degree. Next, I'll present some high level comparison with Protostar, which is the topic of next talk. There's some perception that one can actually do better without the sum check protocol. Uh, so I'm going to use three axes, prover time, the verifier circuit size, and support for multi-folding. By my multi-folding, I mean the ability to fold more than two instances at once. It turns out that this uh, ability is required for binary tree uh, parallel proving, and also to prove distributed computations. So on the prover time, here's a table that compares the hypernova's prover uh, uh, on two axes, size of an MSM and the field operations that are performed. The key takeaway here is both have the same prover time because some check is actually super fast. So on the verifier circuit, Protostar performs three scalar multiplications and it performs m fewer hashes compared to hypernova. However, uh, uh, Hypernova's verifier circuit can be concretely low uh, because of two things. One is by using cycle fold, we can actually reduce the size of the circuit on the second curve in the curve cycle. And by using snark-friendly hashes, we can keep the concrete cost of this hashing quite small. Finally, Hypernova supports efficient multifolding. By efficient, I mean that these uh, D log n, log hem ashes are actually amortized across all the k different instances that we want to fold. Whereas Protostar does not support multi-folding, uh, there is a recent proposal called Proto-Galaxy that uh, su does support multi-folding, but it requires logarithmic number of hashes that grow with the number of instances to be folded. So key takeaway here is that Hypernova retains some advantages in some contexts. Another misconception that I want to clear is that folding special sound protocols is more expressive than folding CCS circuits. In these interactive protocols, each round the prover uh, sends a vector, or the verifier sends some challenge, and these interactions proceed in K rounds. Uh, the verifier then uh, runs a set of degree D checks on the concatenation of these vectors. This type of protocol is useful for realizing lookup arguments because they require, these lookup arguments require at least one round of interaction. It turns out that there is a standard technique to perform such randomized checks inside circuits. For example, it's described in this book. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, and I'm going to just quickly go through that recipe. So we just first make the protocol non-interactive using Fiat Shamir. Then uh, we take the CCS witness to have K components, one for each of the vectors that were sent in the interactive protocol. Then we take Z to be the concatenation of all those vectors along with some X augmented where X augmented is a concatenation of X and the challenges, and we also require these challenges to have been obtained through fiat Shamir transformation. It, it, and then we could use uh, CCS to enforce arbitrary constraints on those concatenated vectors. 
A key takeaway here is that once we have a folding scheme for CCS, it can be used as a folding scheme for any non-interactive special sound protocols. So to summarize, uh, folding schemes unlock prover efficient ZK snarks. Hypernova is a new prover efficient ZK snark. Hypernova is surprisingly more powerful than it appears. For example, it has the same prover efficiency as Protostar. It supports efficient multi-folding. It can fold arbitrary public coin interactive protocols like lookups. It can also support multiple circuit types, for example, non-uniform IVC via supernova. I didn't discuss this, but it can be done. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Great. Are there any, any questions? Actually, let me start by maybe asking you about the implementation status of Hypernova. Yes. So how can you, I, I think you said something about the implementation, but say, can you say a bit more about how complete is the impl implementation? Is it commercial strength? Is it available? And so on. So Nova implementation is public, so it's uh, been out from a year. But the so Hypernova, there is, I think there are some uh, implementations by others. We haven't released an implementation yet. I see. Uh, OK. So hopefully that's coming. Or? Yes. Uh, at some point. Okay, good. Are there any other, any other, yeah, please. Uh, there's a mic up there. What does the developer experience of writing circuits in Nova or Hypernova look like, and how should we be prepared for that? Yeah, so there are currently, I think, a couple of different ways to use Nova. One of them is you could use uh, Bell Person, I think, which was recently uh, upgraded to Bell Pepper. So you could write a circuit in Rust and Prue. There is another one where you can use Nova, another tool called Nova Scotia, where you can write your circuits in CIRCOM and then feed it to Nova using Nova Scotia. And there, I think there is one more Lurk. You can express your programs in uh, a Lisp-like language and then prove it using Nova. Um, but I think there are maybe more that I'm missing. Yeah, please. Hey, thanks for the talk. Can you go to the last slide again, please? The previous one? Oh, we need to go to the slides? Can no, you guys after go back this. To the slides? Yeah. Oh, before this? No, no, after the last one. Sorry, is this the one? Take away. After this is the summary. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm curious about actually that uh, point that you can follow arbitrary public and interactive protocols. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, so it's exactly this one. So we take an interactive protocol, we make it non-interactive, we could then express uh, uh, the knowledge, uh, we can express that protocol as a circuit, um, meaning that uh, if the protocol is knowledge sound, it's equivalent to the circuit being satisfying. Okay, so uh, like expressing it as a circuit and doing CCS uh, and hypernova on that. Yeah, so, so the verifier like takes, uh, so in these protocols, the verifier takes concatenation of all the vectors, performs degree D checks. We could write a circuit that takes those vectors in the witness okay. and performs the same checks. So you haven't like uh, the lookup that you have in the paper in hypernova, have you tried to like integrate it into the CCS constraint system? So, uh, so that, that particular lookup argument can also be uh, done this way. So it's, it's described as a separate folding scheme, but you could integrate that or any other lookup argument, including uh, lasso or log derivatives into this. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah. So first, thanks for the nice talk. And it's cool that in the D equals two case, you got the number of MSMs down by one relative to Nova. I guess my question is whether Nova retains any advantages if you're dealing with R1CS. Uh, so, like yeah. other costs beyond the MSM man. Yeah, I think uh, there, there may be some advantages in terms of uh, the verifier circuit. Uh, for example, Nova, as it exists, it just performs a constant number of field operations, hashes, and yeah. scalar multiplications. Here, uh, we would do logarithmic number of hashes. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that might be one trade-off. Uh. Thanks. Great, oh, yeah, thank thanks, Trinus. This was a really, really fantastic talk. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is uh, Bin Yi, who's gonna talk about uh, um, uh, Protostar, and this is joint work with uh, Benedict Bunz.
So, Bini, the floor is yours. Hello. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name is Bing Yi, and today I'm gonna present Protostar, which is a new generic and efficient IVC scheme. And this is joint work with spent commands from Espresso Systems. So in the blockchain world, we've seen there are many objects following an iterative pattern of computation. For example, a delay function is defined as a step function executing t times, where t is some dynamic hardness parameter. Also, blockchain, you can understand it as something like state transition machine, where the ledger state is repetitively updated by executing transactions block by block. Another example is the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM, which is basically the computational model used by Ethereum for smart contract execution, where at each step, you are executing one of the many supported OP codes. So in this talk, our goal is to enable efficient verification of this type of computations, which leads to powerful applications like a verifiable delay function, succinct blockchain like Mina, and also ZKEVM, which allows you to prove correct execution of smart contract without letting the validators to receive this execution trace and re-execute the program. So more generally, we want to solve this problem, give some initial input and some final output of this iterative computation, where at each step, you ask some step function, giving some online witness. The prover wants to convince the verifier that this execution was done correctly, but without sending all this intermediate witness and let the verifier to re-execute everything. So key here is to want to really have the succinct proof and make the verifier really efficient. Interestingly, this primitive for solving this problem has actually been introduced back to 2008 by Paul Villains, even before Bitcoin was invented. So this is called IVC scheme, or incrementally verifiable computation scheme. So here, instead of sending the entire intermediate witness for the execution, the prover can generate a really tiny IVC proof and the incrementally update it as time goes by. And the correct verification of this proof implies correct computation of this entire com of the entire execution. So we want completeness, meaning that the prover should be able to generate an update to the next IVC proof, given the previous IVC proof and the online witness for the last execution step. Also, we want not soundness, meaning that the prover, uh, if he can pass the verification check, he should actually know the right witness for this computation. It was actually well known that IVC can be constructed from SNARKs, which is another powerful primitive for proving uh, relations, MP relation statements with some fixed size. The idea is simple. Well, the IVC prover will, uh, will just generate a SNARK proof for the statement that first, the last execution step of this step function was done correctly, and second, the previous IVC SNARK proof was correctly verified. And this implies that all the previous computation were done correctly. So this kind of a recursive snark idea is really neat, but however, it's not, like, it's not commonly used in practice. This is mainly because this recursive circuit for representing this snark verifier is really, really expensive. Therefore, people are asking whether we can construct IVCs from even weaker primitives without using snarks. And the answer is yes, and recently there are some really great works um, that construct IVC from uh, another pr weaker primitive called a split accumulation scheme, or folding scheme. Intuitively, this kind of scheme is basically, allows you to fold multiple instances with pairs of some relation into a single one. So now instead of checking them one by one, you only need to check the last folded instance. So more specifically, there is an accumulation prover that tries to fold multiple instances with pair into a single one. And also, we need an accumulation verifier that takes some input instance and some folded instance and check they are consistent with, uh, with the help of some helper information from the accumulation prover. And the key highlight here is that this accumulation verifier is really lightweight, meaning that it's much, much more efficient than snark verifier. And this is the key why we can have a much more efficient IVC construction. The reason is that in this recursive circuit, now we can embed this more lightweight accumulation verifier rather than this like, very expensive snark verifier inside the circuit. Finally, there is a decider check that the last fold instance is correct. And 
this primitive has similar notion of completeness and not soundness. It was also um, shown that we have a really efficient IVC constructions given this split accumulation scheme or folding schemes. However, existing accumulation scheme have the following kind of limitations. First, there are many constructions of the folding, but they are usually having very different flavors of description and security proofs, and there's no uh, unified and general framework for analyzing and deploying them uh, in practice. So that's the first issue. And second, like the most popular and most efficient uh, scheme usually use the so-called R1CS-based constraint system, for example, NOVA. And this is basically a language that allow you to represent the relation statements in circuits. However, um, it's kind of less expressive compared to some recent advance that introduced the so-called high degree custom gates and lookup gates, which is more expressive, meaning that with a single gate, you can express more functionalities. We do know there are some elegant work uh, like that support this kind of front ends. However, as accumulation scheme itself, it's, uh, it's less efficient compared to NOVA. Finally, we know that there, uh, most of the scheme are having a relatively poor support for so-called circuit branching. What does it mean? It means that in some uh, cases, at each folding step or as, uh, each execution step, the step function might only trigger one of the branches in this, uh, in this big function. One typical example is actually EVM, where in the configuration you have um, like hundreds of OP codes being supported, but at each step you only execute one of the many possible OP codes. And in a traditional IVC, you still need to prove all this, like every possible branch circuits, and that can make, like, make the scheme really, really expensive. Given this, we have the following contributions. First, we introduce a new general recipe for constructing the so-called folding scheme as well as IVC scheme, where the NOVA is just a special case in this framework. Along the way, we also construct some folding scheme uh, that can support really expressive relation, for example, high degree custom gates, a large lookup table, and efficient circuit branching. In summary, in this resulting IVC, the dominant proving cost is only, uh, is only a one multiscalar multiplication of size of witness, and in this recursive circuit, it's only dominated by three group uh, exponentiations. Compared to a concurrent work, Hypernova, which is also like a great, great paper, and it turns out that I think we have a, a cheaper lookup support because in our set setting, the lookup support is almost for free. And second, in this recursive circuit, we have a log and factor um, number of hash and field operation, but with a trade of two more group operations. Okay, so this is the background. And now let me start to get some meat. And uh, I will start by explaining the general recipe for constructing folding scheme. Recall our goal is to fold multiple instances with pairs into a single one, and we use the following framework. First, we design some so-called special sound protocol for this MP relation, and then, this is a really key step, we transform this protocol into another protocol, but for which the verify is much, much simpler. Basically, the verify only needs to check a one single algebraic equation in this protocol. And after that, we use some standard trick to make it non-interactive, and we introduce a generic way which um, extend, extend NOVA to obtain a folding scheme for the verifier check in this NAC proof. The highlight here is that number of group operation on both the accumulation prover and the verifier side now is independent of the degree of the check, which makes it particularly friendly to support high degree gates. Before delving into details, let me quickly recap what it means by special sound protocol. Uh, given some protocol for proving some relation, we say it's k special sum if k different accepting transcript allows you to extract a valid witness for the relation. For example, in this really naive, very naive example of proving element-wise product relation, what prover can do is directly just uh, send these long vectors, and the, vec uh, the verifier will just check the set of equations, which are kind of expensive. But however, this protocol is one special sum because every transcript is exactly a witness. And we care about three parameters in the, in the class of special sound protocol. First is the number of interaction, it's the number of prover messages in this uh, interact protocol. And second is the maximum degree of each equation checked by verifier. And last is the number of equations checked by the verifier. And in this example, you see that r equals one and d equals two because every equation is a multiplication check with a degree two. And l equals m because there are n different equations being checked. 
So I'll add a note why we care about this strange special sound protocol. There are two reasons. First, compared to directly constructed floating scheme from scratch, it's much, much easier to analyze and design a special sound protocol because we have no succinct or non-interactive uh, requirements. For example, you can see here that we can send a, a really, really long witness and verify can do a really, really expensive verification. The second reason is that compared to directly folding a relation statement as Nova did, um, use special sum protocol enables us to represent some other really complex relation, like lookup using a much simpler uh, special sum protocol, which makes folding much easier. So now let me, suppose we already get a special sum protocol for some target relation. It's straightforward to transform it in non-interact proof using some very standard trick in cryptography, like commit open and fear Shamir. And we've also proven before that the transformation is not sound as long as the original protocol is special sound. Now our goal has been reduced to build accumulator for this knock proof, which is equivalent to build accumulator for the relation we care about, right? So in this knock proof, we split into two parts. The short part is called proof instance, which consists of some really short commitments and the verifier challenges in the original special sound protocol and some public inputs. And the larger part is the opening of these commitments, which are the possibly long prover message in the original special sound protocol. And we say this in the relation, if the set of L equations checked by verifier are satisfied. And every equation is just an algebraic formula of degree D. And now we want to build a accumulator for it, so we, we exactly use the same kind of format. The only difference here in the accumulator is that we add one more error vector commitment, which for which the error vector is put on the right-hand side of the set of equation being checked. This is some trick also used by Nova, and you can understand this as a, a relaxed version of knock verifier check, where each equation, it doesn't need to be equal to zero, but you can equal to some like error as long as this error is committed in the instance. Now the Key problem now is that given some existing accumulator, how to uh, fold some online knock proof onto it to obtain a new accumulator so that a new accumulator is satisfiable if the existing accumulator and knock proof are satisfiable. And this reduced to proof that two sets of equations here uh, in the right, like upper right, like are satisfied. And we do this by doing an interpolation of these two sets of equations by uh, combining the inputs, basically the combining the messages and the challenges using this linear polynomial, xm plus m and xr plus r um, r prime here, and compose it with the set of equations we want to check. And there's a great property of this target polynomial is that the constant coefficient of this polynomial exactly matches the left-hand side accumulator checks, and the degree d coefficients of this polynomial exactly matches the left-hand side of this knock proof check. And therefore, in order to prove that these two set of check equations are satisfied, it's equivalent to proof that this polynomial is some polynomial for which the degree D coefficients are all zero, and uh, the constant coefficient is just the, the error vector committed in the instance. To do this, it's very, uh, it, like, prover just uh, send this polynomial, basically send the coefficients of, the, uh, of this polynomial at degree one to D minus one, and the verifier now will example and re return a random challenge. And now, instead of proving this polynomial identity, we can reduce it to a random evaluation check. This is some standard trick used in cryptography. And now you see this random evaluation check is exactly with the same format of the accumulated check we had before. Basically, we are checking the same set of equation except that this input has been changed. This input just becomes some random mini combination of the original accumulator and not proof. So the folding now become really straightforward. Well, the prover and the verifier just uh, fold this accumulator instance and witness and error commitments using random combination of alpha. And this is it. However, since it become more complicated and expensive when this set of equation being checked has high degree. For example, if degree is super high, then at the beginning of the protocol, the prover needs to perform D times L number of group exponentiation to commit these cross error terms. Well, like you see, there's a D minus one cross error terms, and each of them are, have a length of vector L. And moreover, for verifier, it's also more expensive because it needs to pay like D group exponentiation to fold these error commitments. So to fix this, a key observation is that suppose we have some really good special sound protocol, which is super simple, with a number of checks 
like number of equation being checked is really, really small, then we don't need to pay anything for committing to this long vector because it's a short vector. Why not just do directly use the identity function as a trivial commitment scheme and we can remove all the possible group operation inside. So this gives some, us some hint. So basically, uh, given any special sum protocol that might be expensive in terms of verification, we can transform them into another uh, special sum protocol for the same relation but the verify is much, much, much cheaper in the sense that it only needs to check a single equation. More specifically, we add one more run on top of the original special sum protocol where the verifier will sample a random challenge and the prover will send the power of this challenge. And then the key here is that the new verifier, instead of checking the odd L equations separately, now he only needs to check a randomly combination of these L equations, which is basically a new combined equation. And here, the random coefficient, bj, is just one element sent by the prover. However, this scheme has two issues. The first issue is that, okay, yes, the degree is only increased by one. And the first issue is that the accumulation prover now needs to add one more message, send one more message, which is really long. And the, that means in the knock proof generation, it needs to commit to it, which is also very expensive. And this turns out to actually easily fixable because instead of representing each coefficient as a single element sent by prover, you can represent as a product of k factors sent by the prover. For example, if we set k equals two, now prover, instead of sending all the power of beta, only needs to send two square root L elements as this. And now each power of beta can be represented as a, a product of two elements sent by the prover. But now the prover is sending much like shorter message, which is much, much cheaper and it can be negligible compared to the message already sent in the original protocol. So this solves the first issue. However, the second issue is that the verifier also needs to check, like add more equation checks. So we see we already had a combination that successfully made all these L equation into a single one, but now the verifier needs to add more checks in order to make sure the prover is exactly sending the correct message, like exactly sending the power of beta rather than some like malicious message. Fortunately, these checks are all very, very simple. It's low degree and not too many. And we can use another Patterson commitment to handle it. So we only, that's why we add one more group operation here. And, but I think that that's independent of degree D, so it's not a big, uh, very big deal. So in summary, um, after all these optimizations, the number of group operations in both accumulation prover and the verifier are now both independent of degree D, and we can obtain a really concretely efficient uh, accumulation scheme. Okay, so I, I actually have missed one more point because now after these tricks, like we, we, we make the, this really simple, the verifier only to check a single equation, we still need to figure out how to exactly compute these cross error terms quickly for the prover, right? We haven't specified that yet. But this is actually easy where you just evaluate this polynomial at d different points and you get an evaluation form of this polynomial and do some interpolation like inverse FFTs to recover the coefficient form of this polynomial. That's exactly what you want. But what I want to highlight here is in that in certain cases, which is like very common in practice, we can do even much better. So for example, what if the set of equations are heterogeneous? That means what if among a set of uh, any equations, only 10% of these equation checks are with high degree, but the rest of them are really with low degree. In this case, we obtain an algorithm that have a complexity similar to the pure low degree case. This is useful because sometimes you only want to use high degree case for only a, a few number of constraints. But in this case, our performance won't degrade and it will be similar to the case where the degree are all low. The second case is when we have some uh, like this kind of called branch gates, which means that each equation being checked is of the form of sum of multiple branch equations. And that means, and, and, and only one of them will be active and be non-zero at each execution step. This is something that will happen, for example, uh, in the VM execution simulation scenario. In this case, we use some so-called caching technique to accelerate computation of error terms so that complexity is now independent only on this branch circuit size rather than the entire uh, step function circuit size. So it turns out to be really useful for supporting circuit branching and non-uniform computation and a VM simulation in IVCs. Finally, there is another case when the snark proof is really, really sparse, meaning that like most of the entries are just zero, the number of non-zero entries is much smaller. 
In this case, we can exploit so-called commitment homomorphism and caching techniques to make the complexity to be independent of to this uh, knock proof size. And the complexity is only proportional to the number of non-zero entries. And this turns out to be really useful in accumulating the so-called lookup relation, which I explain later. Okay, so now that's the, that's the whole story about uh, constructing accumulation scheme given some special sum protocol to some interesting relation. But now, in order to get an IVC, we still need to figure out how to build this special sum protocol for some MP complete relation that's expressive enough, right? It turns out to be actually be an easy task. We obtain many one-move special sum protocol for interesting relations, and those schemes are almost trivial. What the prover just sends, directly sends the long witness, the verified director check the set of equations which can be expensive that represent these relations. But it turns out this special sum protocol scenario is even more powerful than that because like enables us to accumulate also some really complex and non-algebraic relation that's not so straightforward to fold into some really uh, simple special sum protocol that can be easy to fold. One typical example is that the, the lookup relation I mentioned which the goal is to prove that some secret witness are inside some pre-processed uh, lookup table that, uh, that, for example, you want to prove some elements is inside the range of zero to two to the 64. In this case, we, we define some, uh, design some really simple special sum protocol such that exactly has some really sparse witness and low degree checks. And this turns out to be really helpful. So after combining with the general recipe, we obtain the first transparent lookup uh, accumulation scheme for the lookup relation for which the prover time is independent of the lookup table size, which might be of independent interest. So after composing all this interesting uh, special sum protocol for interesting relation, we can obtain the special sum protocol for the MP-complete relation we, we care about, which support a lot of expressive gates like high degree gates and lookup gates. So in summary, we've introduced a new generic and efficient way to build folding, to construct folding scheme and that supports to uh, support really front, uh, advanced front end, which can be really expressive. And after combining the general recipe and uh, efficient IVC compilers, we obtain an IVC called Protostar, which is highly practical, that can efficiently support high degree custom gates, large, uh, really large lookup tables, and efficient circuit branching. At last, I want to mention one of the many uh, interesting open questions. There are more, but for time reason, I won't talk about um, all, of, all of that. But one such an intriguing uh, question to me is that to construct an accum accumulation scheme for the so-called online memory lookup relation, for which we have a prover time that's independent on the memory size. And what it does it mean? It's, mean? it's basically the same uh, uh, problem with lookup relation. The only difference here is that the lookup table is no longer fixed or preprocessed. It can be some online memory that can be dynamically updated. And this can be very, the solution to this can be really useful to simulate some large memory read and writes, for example, in CKE VM application. So I do think it's a really meaningful question and encourage everyone to think about it and improve it. Okay, so for time reason, I'll stop here and thanks everyone for listening and I'm happy to take more questions. Yeah, great, we have time for a few questions. Actually, let me ask you, like, I, I just want to make sure that this uh, kind of your, your opinion here is, is expressed. Like, if you wanted to compare, let's say, um, some, you know, large, long ZK EVM computation, you can do it using a monolithic snark, like Plonk or Marlin or any of the others, mm -hmm. or you can do it using these folding schemes. Mm -hmm. So, I guess, kind of to summarize the two talks, in your opinion, which one do you think is the better way to go now? Uh, <laughs> it's a hard question. Uh, I think it depends on the uh, scenarios. I think if you, if you can split this large computation uh, into a lot of small parts, and if you can like, use the IVC or PCD, that can have a really good parallelism. I think PCD is a really good choice. And also another advantage of using PCD or IVC is because like, uh, you, don't, you don't need to like, fix the size of the circuits or fix the configuration of the circuits. It can be, the key difference is like, this is dynamic. So it's, I think it might be better to, uh, easier to maintain or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess the main, main arguments are still the parallelization. It's like generic parallelization way to do it. Like while for SNARK, you, you really need to have a really parallel friendly SNARK to achieve similar results. Mm -hmm. But I agree that there's also some overhead in IVC because in the recursive circuits, you need to add more logic. So that's some kind of trade-off. 
Um, I don't have a, like a full answer to this, but mm -hmm. it's just uh, like encourage everyone to dis discuss this. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer is it depends, and maybe probably requires a bit more uh, research. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Although, would you agree too, Sridhar? Yeah. It's so the same. Okay. Yeah. There's, agree there's agreement between the two of you. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Great. We have time for a few more questions. If anybody has any any more questions, please. Yeah. yeah. Mike's over there. Okay, yeah, so you give us like a general compiler from like an ARC scheme to like an accumulation scheme for these verifiers, right? Is it possible to like do this compiler if the NARC is in some idealized communication model, like an IOP or, or a, a random oracle model? Is it possible to build accumulation schemes for those verifiers? Without, with those verifiers or without those verifiers? Can you? W sorry, what did you say? What's the exact question? Sorry. Oh. Maybe you can, can repeat you the me? question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it possible to build uh, accumulation schemes or folding schemes for verifiers in idealized models, such as IOPs oh. or, or in the random oracle model, without having to instantiate completely? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, like, you mean, don't, don't need to use VHMI uh, heuristic. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure. Yeah, you mean, uh, doesn't use any heuristic assumption, you are saying? Yeah, that's a that's a really hard question, I think. Yeah, so I don't have a full answer. Uh, the, the main question is like, uh, how can we prove the like IVC directly in the uh, kind of uh, random oracle model without using any heuristic assumption? Currently, we are having some heuristic assumption. We will always uh, embed some hash in, inside this recursive circuit. Um, there is some work recently by Alessandro Chiesa that tried to solve this, partially solve this. But it's a really active area of research. Uh, I don't have full answer to that, though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's an uh, optimization that you're talking about, about the betas. Uh, and the uh, uh, question is, why stop at uh, square root of, oh. of the length and, and not go full logarithmic? That's a good question. So yeah, in general, you can increase k whenever you want. There's a trade-off uh, in the here that's uh, when k is large, the number of elements you send is smaller uh, and uh, shorter, but uh, there is a trade-off in the degree will increase as well. It right? becomes d plus k. And also, we choose k equals 2 because it's kind of a sweet spot because usually for all the relation we care about, the prover already needs to send a lot of messages in this original uh, special sum protocol. And when you change k, k, k equals 2, square root l is usually much already much smaller than the message we already have. So that's the reason we choose k equals 2 usually. But definitely, you can easily generalize to, to k larger than 2. And, and what is the practical kind of uh, uh, length of, of? So L, L what, what's the practical? Uh, L, you can understand as number of gates of, uh, of, a, of a circuit, for example. Yeah, but, but what are the practical sizes of, for L? Oh, oh, I see. So I guess. It depends on the, the recursive circuits, right? Uh, usually for IVC, the recursive circuit won't be too large. I guess it's like uh, 2 to the 2 to the 16, like around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So square root L be like like less than two, less than 1,000, right? To the less than 1,000 is negligible uh, from my own perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I guess we have time for one yeah. last question. Yeah. It seemed, it seemed like there was some disagreement about the generalization between CCS and special sound protocols. You made the point that you can represent algebraic or non-algebraic arguments like lookup arguments using special sound protocols. And I think the counterclaim was made earlier that CCS is able to generalize any special sound protocol. Could you comment further on that? Uh, so for lookup, I'm not so sure if, if we can represent CCS easily. But uh, I do want to mention that uh, like there's no conflict in these two scenarios. For example, in our framework, uh, I mentioned here, we can also easily extendable to support CCS in this setting. And CCS is also a very good the constraint system because like, it generalizes R1CS to higher gates, but also uh, saves a lot of additions. So it depends on the setting you want. And also, if, even if you want to use CCS, you can use the, this framework of special sound uh, protocol uh, framework. Yeah. Of the answer your question. Okay, great, excellent. Thank you, Bini. Thank you. Yeah, excellent talk. Okay, and now for the last uh, talk of the day, it's a real treat. So Eli Ben Sasson is going to is going to tell us about uh, Starks and 
Starkware and the future of Starkware. Ellie is the is founder so of uh, uh, Starkware, it? and it's a really wonderful. This is an invited talk. It's a really wonderful, uh, wonderful way to end the first day. So, um, thanks to Dan and the organizing committee for um, uh, inviting me to give this talk, and uh, for organizing the marvelous uh, SBC conference, which is uh, undeniably the very best conference on research in uh, blockchain. So, thanks. Um. <laughs> so I want to tell you about uh, three things. Uh, the current state of Stark research and implementations, uh, a few recent highlights on research, and then uh, some, some thoughts about future directions. And if there's one uh, meta message I want to put out there is that if you're a developer uh, or also, you know, a research student looking into uh, stuff to do. So definitely consider um, both for research. There are a lot of questions at the end I'll mention that are very interesting uh, to be resolved about Starks, both theoretical and theory and practice. And if you're a developer looking to build your uh, stack, um, so definitely consider Starks uh, because they're, uh, I'm going to argue, uh, very efficient, probably the most efficient, uh, most safe, most future-proof, and also battle-tested. So uh, what's, what, do, what do we mean when we talk about a Stark? So there are two important letters. Let's forget about the ARC, though it's very important. Um, S stands for scalability, which means the two things happen simultaneously. Uh, proving time scales quasi-linearly quasi -linearly or nearly linearly with the uh, amount of computation being proved, and uh, verification simultaneously is polylogarithmic. Uh, uh, T stands for transparency, which means uh, public coin protocols, no trusted setup. Uh, notice that if you have a setup, it has to be succinct or polylogarithmic in the amount of computation. So if you have a proof system that satisfies these two properties, whether you call it by that name or not, it, is, it satisfies the definition of a Stark. Um, now, most Starks today uh, happen to use Fry. Not all of them, but most of them happen to use Fry. And also some form of succinct arithmetization, which has two components. Usually there's a, a, you know, some crafting of uh, polynomial constraints and then um, some way to succinctly talk about their um, enforcement domains. Um, and then there are many different forms of arithmetization. Um, most Starks used today, not all of them, are post-quantum secure. And uh, I think pretty much all of them are deployed uh, non-interactively using the fiat Shamir transformation. And hence, are also SNARKs, and sometimes they're referred to as Fry-based SNARKs, though I prefer the shorter and uh, starker version. Um, so um, I, I gave a talk uh, three or four years ago that was titled The Cambrian Explosion of Cryptographic Proofs. And um, I surveyed you know, some of the proofs that were back then. And since then, of course, there's, there's uh, this enumer uh, enormous explosion in the amount of proof systems and stuff out there. Um, but if we look at things deployed or soon to be deployed over blockchains, um, you could categorize them. And there are many, many different ways to, to parse the world. Uh, but one way is to talk about the associated commitment scheme and you know, some of the um, white papers that are mentioned by, by projects when they deploy them. So uh, you have the, um, um, you have the um, family to which Stark belongs, which are Fry-based. You have uh, inner product arguments, um, such as things like uh, Halo and Bulletproofs and projects implementing over them. And you have the KZG pairing elliptic curve-based stuff, um, um, which uh, I guess uh, Croft 16 is, is like a very famous example of that. And um, so I last gave this talk uh, half a year ago, February 23, and this was the status. And today, um, what has happened, if you just look at the difference, you'll see that there are a bunch more that have joined. Well, again, this is a very a non-scientific uh, sort of uh, gut feeling, Twitter-based, uh, you know, asking my feed, um, um, what, have, what are they using or what do they hail to? And this is the set of answers I got to. I must confess that ever since uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter, then at least my personal feed is, uh, you know, is not as effective and you know, folks are 
I don't know who's, who's reading it anymore, so maybe it's completely biased. But anyways, I digress. Um, so it seems, from my skewed view, that you have a bunch of projects uh, that are joining in the KZG pairing and in, and in Fry. So these two branches seem to be, for now, like the most uh, prevalent. Um, so I'm, later on, I'm going to focus on, on both of them. Um, and basically, um, so, so we have like, you know, two major contenders for your um, commitment scheme uh, today to choose from in terms of like projects choosing what to build their uh, proving systems on. And uh, again, those interested in more like why is this the um, characterization and so on, uh, Google, you know, a Cambrian explosion of cryptographic proofs in my name and you may find more stuff on this. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is that the both the StarkX and StarkNet systems uh, use actually the same prover, and uh, we have just announced last week that we are open sourcing it, um, and the open source ceremony and event and the engineering uh, session is going to be held this coming Thursday um, at the StarkNet Summit in San Francisco. So there's a QR code somewhere here. Uh, please feel free to use it or reach out to any of the StarkNet folks if you want to uh, join uh, this uh, uh, exciting event and get a first-hand and first uh, impression view of the uh, stone prover that has been used uh, by at least by us and probably will be used by a lot of, a lot of other teams. So let me just say a few words about uh, the stone prover. So stone stands for Stark One. Um, I think uh, the second version is gonna be called Stu, uh, or at least that's gonna be my uh, suggestion for it. I don't know about the third version, but... Uh, um, and then, um, what is it? So this is the prover that we've been using for proving the computational integrity and correct execution of generic Cairo executions. And um, the statements proved are all of the same flavor. They basically have two parameters, uh, a program or rather a hash of a program and an input or a hash of an input. When I say input, it actually mixes input and output and it basically says, the statement says, program P run on this input executed correctly. But what is Cairo? So Cairo is a Turing complete uh, von Neumann architecture. It's the first Turing complete Stark system to be run in production. Uh, it's been running in production since June 2020. Um, and it comes with an ergonomic Rust inspired uh, safe linear typing system. And it is what we've been using for everything we've been doing since, uh, you know, over the past three years. And it's all gonna be open sourced in three days. So please come. Uh, and start using it, uh, kick its tires and everything, improve it. Um, it's been used for generating uh, StarkNet uh, TPS of over 100, um, the most performant TPS by, by its uh, uh, capacity, and we've used it for StarkX for uh, trading more than, uh, for letting our customers trade more than $1 trillion uh, and you know, a bunch of other impressive stuff, saving customers more than $1 billion. So it's very battle tested, it's very robust. Please check it out. It's uh, you know, the Stark One Prover, stone hard. Um, another thing I wanna point out is, and this is you know, a confession of uh, you know, uh, theory to practice distance. Um, some of you may know I started my career as a mathematician and theoretical computer scientist, but over the past at least five years, uh, I've been solely or mostly dealing with, uh, with uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and start net, start where. So um, the sad reality is that um, it took us uh, two and a half years from the white paper that had an academic, academic implementation until we reached our first product, and in between probably a total of dozens of engineering years. Um, I was also a co-author of the Zero Cash paper that also had an academic implementation and a co-founder of uh, the Zcash project. Again, a two-year span and dozens of engineering years between you know, white paper with academic code and uh, implementation. There are a lot of uh, details that need to go into something uh, till it reaches maturity. And another uh, uh, you know, fact is that, at least among our resources, if you look at the pie of engineering, probably 5% or maybe even less of the time uh, being um, spent 
is or was spent on the core proving, and then 95% is on everything else, which includes tooling, you know, the Cairo programming language, uh, compiler infrastructure, such as full nodes and sequencers, customization for customers in various uh, use cases, integration with wallets and API services. So there's a, um, all this to say that there is a, somewhat of a distance from uh, between uh, you know, what is theory and, and practice. Um, so now I want to tell you a few of the recent highlights from research regarding Starks and why you should care about them, especially if you care about practical implementations. So um, let's talk about the state of research two years ago and then compare it with what we know today. Um, and later on, I'll give some open questions. You know, we don't know everything that we want to know. There are a lot of very cool research questions out there. So two years ago, uh, we knew how to build Starks efficiently only for certain nice fields, and today we know to do it over all fields. Uh, two years ago, uh, we lacked concrete parameters for analysis of the security of Starks in the random Oracle model, which is a very important uh, model and today we have very very good estimates and also very good numbers and very good understanding of the safety in the random oracle model. Two years ago we didn't have any concrete security analysis for the use of uh, recursive uh, Starks and how security degrades with the uh, depth of recursion and today you have very good analysis with very good numbers uh, for recursive Starks um, and lastly the amount of provable soundness per query of the Fry protocol was much lower by a factor roughly of two um, than what we knew today. Than what we know today, there's still a factor, uh, one last factor too that is an open problem that you know I'll mention towards the end. So um, let's go now. I'm going to go over these four results just a little bit. You know what we didn't know and what we know today, and why you should care about this. So. Two years ago, we knew uh, to build Starks over fields that had uh, subgroups, either multiplicative or additive, but uh, that, you, th that are smooth, that you can, you know, the size two to the K, let's say. And you needed these groups both for efficiency of FFTs and uh, low degree extensions, but you also needed them for the Fry protocol. And um, today, we know how to get uh, um, basically Starks and all the components needed for them on, on any field. Um, and this is very important, for instance, if you want one day to port over a whole bunch of, let's say, Apple-based uh, signatures, which use a very particular curve that is not, in any case, defined over anything that is, uh, you know, a nice field. Um, and the way this is done is basically using the group structure um, of an elliptic curve, and there's an abundance of elliptic curve groups of various sizes and shapes. Well, not that many shapes. They come in mostly one shape, but uh, um, sizes at least. Uh, there's abundance of, uh, of sizes you can choose from. And um, theoretically, it should be uh, pretty much the same performance, but, but this uh, sort of uh, asterisk is very important. The fine print is, so uh, to best of my knowledge, no one has implemented them yet really for like a product and you know, whether it's exactly one X the same running time for a similar size, um, you know, uh, FFT friendly field or two X worse or 10 X worse, we don't know yet, but they should uh, behave similarly, and this is like really terrific news, especially for the future. So right now, any proving uh, system is usually built on one fixed field, but, but we envision in the future where you're going to actually move across different fields very seamlessly and use them for whatever you want. And, 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 and this is something you can do, especially with small fields, only using things that are, well, not only using Starks, but you, you, they, we know how to do it over Starks and we don't know how to do it as efficiently over other kinds of uh, commitment schemes, in particular uh, KZG. So uh, the, uh, the next thing I want to mention is that two years ago, if you asked about the analysis or the security in the random oracle model, what is called T epsilon security, uh, concrete parameters for um, Stark. So y we knew some, you know, theoretical estimates of how to get it. There are like two, well, three major components in building a Stark. There is the IOP, which is a, a very nice, elegant model, but analyzing it is somewhat hard. Uh, sorry, uh, analyzing it is algebraic, but it's just an 
you can't use an IOP model for building your Stark. Uh, you need to add to it things like Merkle commitments and Fiat Shamil. And for that, there was a missing piece in the analysis, which is round by round soundness. So what we know today is that there is very good random oracle analysis for the Starks as they are deployed, whether interactively or non-interactively. And this is very nice work of Block, Gareta, Katz, Thaler, Tiwari, Zachat, I hope I'm pronouncing this name right. Um, very recent, like from two months ago. Uh, we also have uh, the same sort of results in the ETH Stark documentation. And basically the bottom line is that all of the deployed Starks are as sound in the random Oracle model as they are in the IOP model. And in particular, if you know how to analyze the security in the IOP model and you get K bits of security, so if you take a Merkle a tree commitment and you use 2K bits, then you have K bits of security, which is what everyone has been using anyways. Um, and so that seems to be fine. Uh, by the way, a very good open question is whether you actually can, you need 2K bits or you can use uh, less than 2K bits and get the same security. It's an open problem to which we don't know the answer. Um, and it's, you know, you could have something like a factor two in proof length by resolving this. The third result I want to mention is that if you looked at recursive Stark, so everyone, uh, most of the projects deploying Starks in practice are already making use of recursion, uh, both uh, Stark X, Stark Net, but also the Polygon teams, Risk Zero, and so on. And if you looked at the uh, you know, theoretical analysis for what happens to security, we didn't have any good estimates for that. Um, and today, or rather I should say very soon, so this paper, to best of my knowledge, has not yet been um, published. Uh, it's by Kieza, Guan, Samocha, and Yogev. Uh, so it's not out there just yet, but I did get uh, their uh, authorization to mention this result. And it basically says that if you're looking at the model, uh, the relevant model for analyzing security, which is a Q-bounded random oracle model adversary, Basically, uh, the security of recursive Stark, no matter what is the depth of the recursion, is the same as a one-shot Stark, like with no recursion, um, with the assumption that you externalize all of your Merkle tree and Fiat Shamir queries, um, which from a theoretical point of view is something you want to do, but maybe practically, you know, it's a little bit like the Fiat Shamir, you can just... Uh, assume that it's all fine. But anyways, we do have much better handles on what is the use of recursion, and it's pretty safe to use, which is good because everyone's been using it. Uh, so it's good to know that we have the science behind it. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that, well, now I go back three years, um, we knew that every invocation of the Fry protocol, which is the commitment scheme used for um, soundness of, of uh, most of these Starks, you could have one quarter of the logarithm of the rate, uh, many bits of provable soundness. So it means that if you use the blow up factor of 16 or a rate of one over 16, you could provably get roughly one bit of soundness. And it was based on a combinatorial analysis that sort of deteriorated with the number of columns. And what we know today is that actually you get twice as many bits and there's still um, a residual question of uh, is this factor two reduction really needed or not? Um, and then I don't wanna go into the math of this. Um, the biggest change, if we look back three years in Starks that should matter to developers is that three years ago it was very hard uh, to build circuits and do computations with them. You had to do it by hand, uh, which is very uh, hard and uh, you know, safety becomes a big problem. And today, of course, we have many uh, you know, Turing complete programming languages to choose from. Of course, uh, there's Starkware's uh, Cairo, but there's also Maiden. There are a lot of uh, compilers from EVM and other systems um, or standard VMs like the Risk Zero team. So today, if you're a developer, uh, it's much easier to write code and just have it deployed. Now I want to talk about future directions. And um, a big question is, you know, to fry or not to fry? So uh, at least for us at Starkware, we started with this route like five, five years ago. Uh, There's a lot of exciting research all the time. We just heard about folding schemes and other stuff. So, you know, is it, is it still something that you want to use? Maybe it's outdated. And I want to answer that, I think the answer is yes, that it's still going to be much more efficient by a factor of, I don't know, between 10 and 100x uh, more efficient than KZG-based stuff. And I want to explain why. So um, 
this is a very rough back of the envelope uh, calculation that, that we are using inside at Starker. Of course, you need to measure things end to end and do your own research. But if you look at just the commitment part of, uh, let's say, a word, a 32-bit word, in a stream of two to the 20 words. So when you can compare a fry to KZG. So KZG, let's say, over a 256-bit field, which is the standard uh, used today in most uh, teams. So you're going to use Pippinger, which gives you a cost of two times log of the number of bits divided by the stream size, that many group operations. And then, um, you know, asking around a little bit, it seems that around 40 clock cycles is what takes one modular multiplication for a 256 size bit. And then you need roughly 12 mod moles per uh, group operation. Um, and if you sum all of this up, you get around 1,700 clock cycles. Uh, so the stone prover, which again, we're, we're releasing, this is something that we've been working on for the past four or five years, uh, so it's sort of oldish. Um, uh, the, the major cost there, or the, the cost there to commit to the same thing is roughly the FFT cost and then the uh, Merkle commitment cost. And if you use a blow-up factor of B, we use in the code that will be open source the factor of 16, so you, you can tweak it. Um, you have the same mod mall cost of roughly 40 cycles uh, per, um, per uh, uh, mod mall, modular multiplication. And uh, we're using uh, Blake as the hash, which is very efficient. It's uh, roughly 12 cycles uh, for a 32-bit uh, word. And then you get a total of around 700 or so clock cycles. Now, things get even better if you move to smaller fields. So here's an example of 63-bit uh, field. The main difference is that the field size, the, the clock cycles per operation have gone down by roughly 10x, thanks to you know, what uh, modern CPUs can do. And uh, even if you use something like the Poseidon hash, which is not 12 cycles, but around 300 cycles, if you go with a small blow-up factor, um, you get a total of around 400 or 4x better. And of course, if you use something like um, a very small field, like a 32-bit field, and you use the Blake hash, then you get to something like 35 to 40 clock cycles for uh, per element uh, in this uh, modular, sorry, in this uh, hashing. Now, again, this is rough back of the envelope computation. There are many other components uh, to both of these systems in whichever way you do it. But at least to us, this indicates that it's a good, there's, it's, it's a safe bet to say that um, Fry-based systems will, over small fields at least, will continue to be most efficient in terms of proving time. Um, now, what about in practice? So in practice, there are many, many benchmarks. I'll mention that three years ago, at the request of the Ethereum Foundation, um, we proved 100,000 rescue hashes in under 10 seconds on a quad core with 16 gigabytes RAM. Um, and back then, it was 20x faster than the, um, um, than the best uh, KZG, best or Groth 16 implementation, which is roughly in line with uh, uh, you know, the numbers that you see here. Um, and I don't know what is the best KZG best implementation for, let's say, 100,000 invocation of the KZG friendly uh, hash. Um, it's a good question on, on similar um, hardware, but I think it's a good question to uh, benchmark and see where the numbers come out. Um, now, in addition to being the fastest commitment scheme, it's also agile, works over all fields. It's also the safest in terms of no trusted setup, post-quantum security. The security assumptions only assume uh, a collision-resistant hash. Of course, KZG-based uh, systems have a lot of advantages, such as much, much shorter proofs, around 200 bytes, and uh, they have uh, additivity, or they're homomorphically additive, so you can do cool things like folding. Um, and I basically just want to end with um, future research focus. So, because the two main components, or one of the main components in, in Starks is the speed of the hash. And um, right now we're in this sort of sad situation where you, you either pick a Stark-friendly hash, but then it's very slow on CPU, or you use a very modern uh, you know, CPU-friendly hash, but then it's very hard to argue about it in your next recursive invocation. So what we really want is faster Stark-friendly hashes. 
Um, you also want to do uh, better arithmetization, and there's a lot of exciting uh, uh, recent work here uh, that at least excites me. So uh, use of uh, logarithmic derivatives, I think they're, uh, you know, this thing that uh, Ulrich Habuk from the Polygon Zero team started, I think is really, really interesting. There are lookups of various forms, you know, Planck, Lasso, and just like l yesterday, so Ulrich Habok and uh, Shahar Papini, who's somewhere around here, posted uh, a very nice uh, um, sort of update to the Lasso and Log Derivatives paper that I urge you to look and also talk to Shahar. And uh, a lot of work on how do you write your errors. Um, Finally, my favorite math questions. The biggest one is, what is the soundness beyond the Johnson bound? So is the factor two uh, loss in soundness necessary or not? It's a really terrific uh, open problem in math. Uh, what about E.C. Starks over high genus uh, curves, not the elliptic curves? What happens with them? We know that there are amazing error correcting codes over the, such worlds. And then uh, can we replace the Merkle trees with better commitment schemes? Um, I'll just mention that there are a bunch of activities, my time is up, uh, that we'll be doing. Uh, come here, Noam Nissan, talk about uh, fees and uh, tokenomics. Um, I'll be speaking tomorrow at Berkeley, if you wanna hear the more theoretical side of things. If, sorry, if this wasn't theoretical enough for you, there's gonna be more theory tomorrow at Berkeley. And then, uh, of course, join us for the StartNet Summit. So thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Eli. What a wonderful way to end the day. Uh, so again, we have time for questions. If anybody has uh, any questions. Ah, yeah, I see. Please go ahead. Um, thanks for the very nice talk. Just want to ask you compare with a Fry-based Stark with a KZG-based Snark. Uh, how do you consider to compare like Fry-based Stark with the Snarks that not using KZG, for example, using like Hydria, Hydria, like Orin, um, because there are new kind of snarks, like for example, uh, Hyperplunk and uh, Spartan, these kind of like snark systems are actually not using KZG. Would that make snark looks better in this comparison chart? I don't know. I don't know. But like, uh, uh, yeah, one has to do these measurements. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, please. Um, this might be a better question for like an extended conversation, but I am curious about the factor two blow up. Um, so I was curious if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, I can say a lot more about okay. that. <laughs> um, well, there's this thing in error correcting codes called the Johnson bound or the list decoding bound. And right now, um, the provable soundness that we get matches exactly that bound and even uses in a very non-trivial way the Guruswami Sudan algorithm for decoding, uh, for list decoding. And now the question is, what happens above that? And it's a very mysterious regime, also in general for, uh, for like list decoding. It's an area of a lot of active results, uh, sorry, active research. Like what happens between, um, you know, um, one minus square root the rate and one minus rate in that regime? And we don't know. So we know that you cannot get uh, more than a factor two of soundness uh, from Fry because there's a trivial attack um, at that, at that, like at one minus uh, the rate. Um, and then there's this big open problem uh, for Fry. I should mention that for Deep Fry, which is very similar to Fry, we actually know to connect the two open problems. So we know that the soundness of, uh, of Deep Fry is directly related to the list decoding problem. But we don't even know if this connection exists for, for pure Fry. Okay. Thank you. This is probably, if you had to guess in the next 10 years, is this probably, problem going to get resolved, or is this one of these millennial yeah, problems? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be resolved, it's yes. It's going to be resolved. Because there's a lot of exciting, well, there's a lot of research on just list decoding. Yeah. So I think uh, it will be sort of at least tied to it a bit more. I see. Great. All right. I don't know. Ah, oh, yeah. Ramco, one last question. Yes. Please, go ahead. Um, so it's incredible that we now can do fries over any arbitrary field. But another algebraic object that is very popular is the ring of 64-bit unsigned in the integers. Is there any chance we can do fry directly over rings? Oh. Ah. <laughs> um, that sounds like a research question. I need to, yeah, it's a good research question. I would guess that probably the answer should be, uh, it should be somewhat doable, but 
I don't know, like, yeah, no, it's, it's not, uh, I can't, I don't know the answer to that. There is hope. I mean, Thanks. you know, polynomials over rings behave yeah, really that's, weird. Yeah, I know, polynomial, so, well, weird not, things happen. Clear, weird is, things happen yeah. over rings, but it's not like doomed. Yeah. Um, you sure? Because you have cubic polynomials can have lots of, lots of solutions. No, I'm not sure. Of course I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard, that's How a hard, that's a tough sure? question. Okay, that's it. this is a wonderful way to end the day with a hard question to think about. So thank you so much, Eli. Thanks. This is great. Uh, but, 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 our activities for today are not over. So now we are going to transition to our reception. So the reception is going to be outside. The reception is going to run until 7. It's a wonderful time to talk to folks and meet everybody here. The only request is that apparently they're asking not to bring the wine into the building. So it's okay to, ha to drink the wine, but outside. And so enjoy the reception, and we'll see everybody here at 9 a.m. tomorrow.